Good morning. Have you ever had one of those mornings? It's okay, though. Good morning. Uh, if we have not met, I'm Stephanie. I am the Director of Adult Discipleship here at Christ Center. And this morning we are in our last week of a series called The Land Between. And I want to let you know as I start this morning um, that today I'm going to open my soul up a little bit and I'm going to be a little bit vulnerable. And I want you to know that I don't want you to hear in the talk this morning shame or condemnation. This is a talk that maybe could feel a little bit that way, but I want you to know it's not. It's my heart and my struggle in the land between. And I want to share that with you in case you might find yourself in that place sometimes too. And so that's just kind of a little um, warm-up thing. But with that being said, I want to ask you the question. Have you ever been in a situation where you have just been going through the motions? You just know that it's what you need to do, and you're doing it, but your heart is not in it, and you're not connecting. Anybody? Uh, maybe going to the movies, right? Have any of us ever gone to the movie with a friend, family member, spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, and we've gone, and we really are not at all into this particular movie or type of movie, right? Husbands, maybe you've gone to a rom-com with your girlfriends or wives or whatever, you know? Um, or maybe we've gone to a superhero movie and it really wasn't our thing. But we do it, and we do it because we know it's good for the relationship. And so we go, it's not really our favorite. Or maybe you go to a job, and you know that you need the job, you know the job is good for you, but you go every day and you just kind of do the job, but your heart's not in it. Or maybe uh, you got a little puppy at some point, and that puppy was furry and cute and wonderful and amazing. And everything about taking care of this puppy, you loved doing. You were energized by it. You loved it. The puppy was so cute and so great. And then the puppy grew into a normal, regular dog. But now you still have to take care of that normal, regular dog, and you still have to walk the dog and care for the dog. And sometimes we just find ourselves going through the motions, but that puppy love kind of gone. My story around this idea of going through the motions actually is a six-year story. So when I was in the end of sixth grade, I changed schools, and I started seventh grade at Cashmere Middle School. And uh, when I started, I don't think any of the adults had realized that the school that I was in, their math program was at a much slower pace than Kashmir's. So when I got to Kashmir and I'm sitting in math class and the teacher's talking about all this stuff, I am lost. And I'm looking around and everybody else seems totally, they know what's going on. And so after a couple weeks, I finally had to ask a question. I asked a question, and the teacher just shut me down real quick. And at that point, from that point on in seventh grade, through graduating from high school, I never asked another math question. And the problem with that is that for the next six years, I was just going through the motions. And my parents, I would go home and cry because I nothing in me was connecting to math. And my parents would say, it's good for you. You really need it. In order to be a success in life, you have to be able to do math. In order to go to college, you have to be able to do math. And so I would keep going, and I would keep going. I would try to do the homework. I would go in after school for extra help. I would retake the tests, all the things. And I really think the only way I progressed was the teachers felt sorry for me and gave me an A for effort. So I get through, I graduate. And then a couple years into adulthood, I think I was about 22, I decided I wanted to be a teacher. That's what I wanted to do. And so I knew in order to get into the teaching program, I would have to take an entrance exam. And by this point, I had taken no math for a few years, plus I wasn't good at it. And so I hired a tutor. And it was the best thing I ever did. So I show up week one, and week one, she's like, we're just going to, I'm going to throw a bunch of math problems at you. And she could see that I was tense and I was anxious and all the things. But she's like, we're just going to diagnose today. It's not going to hurt. We're just going to diagnose. And so I said, OK. And so we do. And she quickly realized, oh, fractions is where the breakdown happened for you. And how many of us know if we can't do fractions, the rest of math is not going to go well for us, right? 
And at that point, all fractions were to me were an idea, a number on a piece of paper, but they didn't have any value. I wasn't, I wasn't connecting. And so I show up the next week, and instead of pencil and paper on the table, she just has the table covered with measuring cups and measuring spoons. And she has flour, sugar, all the stuff. And so she scoops up a half a cup of flour, and she scoops up a half a cup of, um, another half a cup of flour, and she dumps them in the bowl, and she says, how much flour is in the bowl? I say, a cup of flour. She said, you just added fractions. And for the next hour, we did that. And at the end of it, I had made a connection. It finally made sense. So for years, I had been looking at these numbers, and all I saw were these numbers that had no value. And all of a sudden, there it was, and the light just came on, and the connection happened. And over, I looked forward. From that point on, it wasn't going through the motions. I now was looking forward to meeting with her every week and growing and developing and learning, and it made sense, and it applied to life, and I got it. And it was just such a great moment. And from there on, um, I, I got from going through the motions to a much better place. So I want us to just think about, I don't know, um, there, on this side of life, there's the I believe, right? And I even believe that math is good for me, and I believe I need it in my life. And on this side over here is I'm, I'm energized, I'm growing, I'm developing. I'm not just going through the motions, I'm really in it. And then the land between, the going through the motions. And I think that sometimes we can find ourselves in our faith and on our faith journey going through the motions. And sometimes it's really hard to walk into a place like this where the person next to you is like, they get it. They're connected. They're fully connected. Like you can feel it standing next to them. And you're standing there and you're singing, but you're like, I'm missing something. I'm not fully connected. I'm, I'm going through the motions, but I'm, I'm struggling. God um, cares about this in our lives. In fact, in the Old Testament, God spoke to this. Father God spoke to his people, the Israelites, through the prophet Isaiah, and he spoke to this condition of going through the motions. And it is so important that Jesus, in the New Testament, used the same words that Father God used in the Old Testament, Jesus used them again in the New Testament to talk to a group of religious leaders. Now, before I tell you what he said, some of us in the room right now might be thinking, well, I'm not a religious leader. And I want to talk about that for just a second. I want you to imagine that there's somebody in one of our communities Maybe they heard about God in VBS, or maybe they see the neighbors go off to church every week, or maybe the neighbor kid comes over to their house and talks about Sunday school, and and that person begins to wonder and be curious about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and want to know more. That person most likely is not going to go down to City Hall and ask about God. Probably not going to go to the fire department to seek out answers, spiritual answers or spiritual direction they're most likely going to come to one of us that they know is a Jesus follower. Or they might go to a church. That is probably where they're going to go to get spiritual direction, which the church is all of us. So in a sense, that makes all of us religious leaders. We are leading other people as they are curious about God come to believe in God, put their faith in God. And so I think that these words that Jesus spoke to these religious leaders could also be spoken to us. And I think they're at least worth holding up and examining. So Jesus says this to this group of religious leaders. He says, these people, this is in Matthew 15, 8 through 9. He says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In other words, these people are going through the motions. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Now, in this particular moment and situation, Jesus is actually talking, it it sounds silly to us, but in their day, these religious leaders were worried about hand-washing. 
and they were worried about all the rules around hand washing. And that might not make a lot of sense to us, but we also have man-made ideas that can um, distract us, that can pull us away, and the proximity of our heart can get drawn into these man-made ideas and concepts, right? Instead of drawing closer to God, man-made stuff can distract us and draw us away. And so I think we want to look at our own proximity to God. Where do we stand? Um, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That word hearts is the, in the original, is cardia, and it's kind of this all-encompassing word. It means our mind, our character, our inner self, our will, our intention, the center. Uh, One of the definitions said the desire producer that makes us tick. The heart is that thing that pumps out that desire that makes us act and move about in our lives. And so what Jesus was saying to this group of religious leaders that if we're looking to analyze where the disconnect is in our own lives, if we find ourselves either now or at some future point in a place of disconnectedness, we have to ask ourselves, like we have to go through and analyze, is my character far from God? Is my mind far from God? Is my inner self far from God? Is my will far from God? Is my intention, what are my intentions every day when I wake up? What are my intentions? Are they far from God? Are they close to God? Um, Are my intentions centered around me or are my intentions centered around God? And I read this verse when I was really young, and I honestly believe like God just tattooed it on my soul. I don't know, but it, is, it never goes away. I, this, this, this question bothers me often. Am I worshiping in truth or am I worshiping in like my outward motions, but my inner heart is distracted? I especially wonder this going into religious holidays. So next week is Easter. And these are questions, and again, remember, I'm letting you into my my world. So this is not a shaming or condemnation. This is just my struggle. And sometimes I've come to realize when I struggle with something, other people do too. So going into Easter, these are the questions. Am I really connected to the death of Jesus? Does it really mean something to me? When I see a cross, do I even notice it anymore, or does it just blend into the background? Do I feel any kind of his suffering or the trauma that he went through or the amount of blood, sweat, and tears literally it took him to say yes to being allowing himself to be taken to that cross? And when I come in next week, we say, our words are, we're coming to celebrate Jesus, celebrate his resurrection. But when I come in, is, is that celebration going to be authentic? Is it going to be real? Or are my words a farce? I believe that Jesus, Scripture tells us this, and I believe it, that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when you read this story and you think about the disciples that had walked with Jesus, and you think about and read about the moments where they encounter dead Jesus, alive, Right? They're walking along, and all of a sudden, that Jesus that died on that cross is alive, and he's talking to me. Like we see in the story when we read it in the accounts of Jesus, something happens, something begins to happen. It's a process, but you see something begin to happen to the disciples. Their lives began to be changed, and What we know if you read the story is not only did it happen when they encountered dead Jesus now alive, but the process continued as they were obedient. Jesus had told them, go into the upper room and pray. And we know that when they went into the upper room in an act of obedience and they prayed, we know eventually the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God was poured out on them. And if you read and you read the disciples before that happened, and you read the disciples after that happened, 
you kind of can see this idea of them going through the motions and not fully connecting and not fully getting it. And then after they had an encounter with dead Jesus alive and after they had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, they changed and they were all in and they were fully, fully connected. It takes an encounter. This past week, Steve and I watched um, the David Beckham um, documentary. And this is, if you don't know who David Beckham is, he's a soccer player. And um, this is the description of the documentary. Meteoric rise from humble beginnings to global football stardom. Football, they call it football in Europe. Um, we call it soccer. But this idea of this rise to stardom. And as we watched this, I, could, I couldn't help but note the number of times that they compared David Beckham's stardom to religion. They did it over and over, and I was like, why are they doing that? The, the guy narrating the documentary was doing that because he recognized worship, and worship goes with religion. And he recognized that all of the people in these huge stadiums were worshiping David Beckham, and they were worshiping that soccer team. You can see it, you can feel it, even through the documentary. They are raising their hands, they are singing songs, they are jumping up and down, they are hugging each other. I mean, it, you can feel it across the TV screen. Equally, you can feel it when David Beckham makes one mistake. He makes one bad choice, he gets booted from the game. And these people turn from worshiping him to all out hating him. And it's a good picture to us of why we as humans cannot and should not accept worship. But anyway, so, so we're watching David Beckham, and we recognize worship when we see it, when we watch this documentary. And why do we recognize it? We recognize worship because we were created to worship. We were created by our creator to worship. And when you first hear that, you go, well, that kind of feels like God's a little egotistical. Like, he just, what, created a bunch of worshipers? But if you have ever been in a situation, maybe a football game where your team wins the state championship, or you have been somewhere where you have felt the energy of some kind of worship, you know that worship is not one way. It is not just me to hear, but God, the way he created worship, the glory of God, we get to experience some of that. We get to feel his felt presence when we are truly able to be set free by an encounter with God and truly worship him. There is something that happens to us as well. And so I believe that when God created, he created that we also would receive a blessing from worshiping and being in his presence. That's not why we do it, but there is something that happens to us in a good way as well. So this just continues me on this self-reflection journey, and it makes me ask the question of myself, why is it easier for me to worship a person, a team, an American idol, even like I think sometimes, and this isn't, I just think sometimes even in churches we can worship a person on a stage. Like it is so easy for us to worship in the human realm. Why is it harder for us to worship God? Why is it harder for an authentic praise and celebration to come from our center uh, when it's not a person, but when it's God. And I think it's because of the disconnect. I think it's this whole idea of being either connected or not connected. And so I started thinking about how do we connect? As human beings, how do we connect? Well, we connect through love. And I was thinking about this in um, relation to God. And I was thinking about, some of you have heard about the five love languages, some of you haven't. But here's the five love languages. Serving is a love language do we serve God? That would be a way that we would connect with him. Quality time is a love language. Do we give God quality time? Words of affirmation. God gives us words of affirmation all throughout scripture. Do we give him words of affirmation? God gives us gifts. Do we give him gifts? And what, what would that look like? What would that be? 
And that means we have to get into the Bible and we have to read it to figure out what, what would it look like for me to give God a gift. And we have to ask him. And that takes work and it takes quiet and it takes reflection. It's a lot easier to buy a ticket to a game. Connecting with God is more challenging, but I would also venture to say more rewarding. Physical touch. Jesus said, as you have done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. So are we connecting with God through love? Belonging connects us. Do we know that we belong to God? Do we know that we belong here? Shared interests connect us. This is an interesting question. Have I ever thought about what God is interested in? What interests God? What interests Jesus? What interests the Holy Spirit? Something, and then do, do my interests align? Because we connect over aligned interests, interests that are the same. That's how we connect. Am I connecting with God through my interests? Gratitude connects us. We live in a culture that is like, we thrive on complaining and making it cute and turning it into a meme. I mean, I'm guilty. I send my friends memes all the time, and they're usually not gratitude memes, you know. But, but are we changing that up, and are we choosing to give God gratitude? Trust connects us. Do we trust God? Availability connects us. Do we make ourselves available? Do we leave margin in our lives for God? Consistency connects us. Um, scripture calls us to a Sabbath, one day out of every seven, where we literally, intentionally, purposely put the cares of the world right there. We put them there, and we walk away, and we draw near to God. And there were so many rules around it in the Old Testament. I think we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater, and we just don't Sabbath anymore. But I think that, again, if we're looking to connect with God, if we're learning to draw near to him, and so that that celebration and that worship can be real and authentic, one of the things that I think we can look at our own lives and say, is that an area? For me, all of these can be areas I need to work on. But maybe for this year, I can pick one, and I can just say, you know, Sabbath. And Sabbath has been on my heart a lot lately. Like, I am terrible at putting the cares of the world here and walking away for a day. But it's an area I could grow, and I could get better. Remember how I said the disciples' lives began to change when they had an encounter with God? And what began to happen to them is they began to grow, they began to understand, connect more fully, and they began to be all in. Our celebration of Jesus rising from the dead is next Sunday. And my heart, the desire of my heart, is that I wouldn't fall into that category of worshiping with my mouth and my heart being far away, but rather that when I'm worshiping, it is like better than any championship game I've ever been at, any... Um, Basketball is so fun right now, and I love every minute of it. Um, but that even more so than that, that when I come in here next Sunday, there is just a joy and energy and excitement inside of me because I get to worship and celebrate Jesus, my Savior. So how, how do I do that? How do I prepare my heart? Um, so what I want to do today and this morning, and it may not be for everybody. Some of you might be like, Stephanie, I am hot right now. I am on fire. I am not cold. I am not lukewarm. I am there. That is fantastic, and that's okay, and I, hopefully God can still use this. But maybe, just maybe you're like, you know, I want that too, and if I'm being really honest, like, yeah, it, I'm going through the motions because I know it's good for me, and I know it's the right thing. And so I was just thinking about how I could prepare my own heart. And so I, um, I wrote up a little soul challenge. And you guys should all have them in your chair fronts or underneath the chair. Um, and if somebody around you doesn't have one, they just kind of got dispersed. We had more chairs than we had copies. So you just make sure anybody that want, wants one around you also has one. Does anyone need one? Okay. So... Um, I wrote this out, and I'm going to do it Monday through Friday. You could do it, um, 
you could pick, I'm going to do Wednesdays and just Wednesday. Or you could say, I'm going to do them all on Saturday. Or you could say, I'm not going to do them at all. <laughs> but what, however you want to do it. Um, but I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to go through how I'm going to do this and the why behind it. First of all, I'm going to pray. Because I want to say to God, God, it has to be you. You have to choose to reveal yourself to me. You have to choose to meet with me. But I also equally have faith. His word says, if I draw near to God, he will draw near to me. And I believe that. God, you say, if I draw near to you, you will draw near to me. God, I'm going to do it this week. I'm going to draw near to you, and I pray that you will meet me. And that's how I'm going to start every day of this. But then the first thing, and this, this is not like feel-good stuff. I'm just going to warn you a little bit. First thing is, if we don't understand sin, and we don't understand our sin, not my kids' sin, not my parents' sin and what they did to me, not my uncle Tommy's sin, my sin, if I don't understand that, then connecting with Jesus is going to be really hard, especially at Easter. Like, we have to feel the weight. And the thing is, in our culture today, we don't talk about sin very much. And sin, like, what is sin? I don't know if I'm sinning. I don't, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. Doesn't seem like it's that big a deal. Yeah. But the thing about sin that is so deceptive is when we are sinning, whether intentionally or not even aware of it, we, God is God, he's here. But what we do is we move our proximity. And then we wonder, how come I'm not connecting? How come I'm not having an encounter with God? How come I'm not, what's going on? Why am I not getting this? And so the very first thing we have to do in the diagnosis is ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us our sin. And I gave, I gave some scripture there that we can read. Um, Paul, if you are familiar at all with the Bible, Paul wrote a lot of our New Testament. And in the New Testament, he says, in Romans, he says, Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? We are all dominated by sin. It, like, is, it's knocking at our door all the time. It's crouching. It's waiting for us. It wants to grab us. It wants to own us. And it wants to hold us back from everything that God created us to be and do. It wants to distract us, and it wants to take us down. That is sin. And so if we're aware of it, if all of a sudden we go, oh, God is not shaming and condemning us, that's where we get to the, oh, Jesus. Ah, oh, I get it. So we, uh, Monday, Tuesday is just that. And um, on Tuesday, we read about the Holy Spirit revealing our sin. It says that the Holy Spirit is our helper. And you and I are thinking, but, oh, I don't want to really know my sin. That's not really helpful, you know. But it is because that is the thing that will open up to our freedom and to us walking closely with God. So praying for a revelation from the Holy Spirit. Wednesday, I have scripture where we can um, read about the crucifixion. And I gave Luke because I think Luke is the most... Um, it was written to the Gentiles, and we kind of fall in that category. So I gave that one. But if you're like into this and you're really going for it, you could also read about the crucifixion in Matthew, Mark, and John. And I also said maybe write out like the different ways that Jesus suffered. And then you could go through and say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being willing to have your friends turn their backs on you. Thank you for being willing to be spit on. Thank you for being willing to have thorns shoved in your head. Thank you, Jesus. And we can go through and we can give him that thanksgiving. Thursday, I love this, in Romans 8, 25, Paul says, Thank God, the answer is Jesus. Um, I love that little section of scripture in there. But Holy Spirit, teach me what that means. What's the question? If the answer is Jesus, what's the question? Holy Spirit, show me. 
Holy Spirit, I pray your word would come alive to me. And I encourage you, uh, if you're doing this with me, um, the message translation is so great. It just gives us another way of reading it and understanding it. The words are more relevant to those of us in 2024 today. Um, and so read it in the message translation. And again, ask God to help you connect. And then Friday, anticipating. Looking ahead to Easter on Sunday. You know, if we're going to go to a big, huge, if any of us had tickets right now to uh, March Madness, right? We would be counting the days. We'd be so excited. We'd be packing our suitcase, planning everything, the ride, how we're going to get there, what we're going to wear. We'd be buying our merch. We'd be doing all the things. Let's anticipate coming in here next Sunday. And let's anticipate that sometime this week we had had an encounter with the living God. And when we all come in here together, what is going to come from us is celebration and true authentic worship because we understand what we're worshiping. Amen? Amen. I want to pray for us. Before I do, the last thing I'm going to say, text me email me, call me, any literature that we have around this church anywhere, except for the paper I gave you, I should have put it on there, but it has my phone number, has my email, stephanie at christcentercashmere.com. Most of you have my phone number. Um, it's on brochures and flyers. Get a hold of me, let me know, let me know. Hey Steph, I took the challenge. Hey Steph, it's Tuesday, I'm reading this. This verse really stuck out to me. Hey Steph, it's Thursday, I'm feeling nothing. I'm still going through the motions. I've been in the word, I've been praying, I'm not feeling anything, will you intercede for me this week? I want you to reach out to me this week. I'm gonna be doing it, it will help me, you guys will help me because I'm gonna be doing this too and you will hold me accountable. Um, and then if I know you're doing it, I can check in with you too. But let's as a church and let's as a body of believers, let's really um, be intentional with our minds and our hearts this week. So next week when we come in, um, God is pleased with us. Will you pray with me? Father God, you know my heart, and I think my heart beats the same as many in this room. We want to please you. We want to glorify you. We want our worship to be in spirit and in truth. We want to love you through acts of service. We want to love you through um, words of praise and affirmation. We want to love you through giving you gifts. We want to love you through spending quality time with you. God, we know we were created to be connected to you, to be up close and personal with you. I pray that you would protect our time this week, that you would empower us with your Holy Spirit to do the work. It's hard. It takes work, and we need your help to do it. Left to our own devices, we are weak. But God, we open our hands and surrender, and we ask you to help us draw near to you, empower us, inspire us, encourage us to do that. And we just pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.